excited about what we're about to get into. I want to plunge into it, but I want to pray with you first. Father, you are the God of all the children of the world, red and yellow, black and white. If we get to heaven and we see you exactly like we thought you were, that'll be okay. We'll all grow up in you anyway. On this first Sabbath, just hours into 2021, infuse these moments with the mighty spirit of Christ. Let our hearts be touched and drawn to him. We pray in his name. Amen. I hold in my hands Time Magazine, cover story. Can you see it there? Xing out 2020. Pretty uh, basic graphic. It's actually an essay uh, written by Stephanie Zacharek, titled the essay, The Worst Year Ever. Can I get an amen to that? <laughs> oh, man. The whole world is talking about this. Xing out 2020. So let's just get the line or two of uh, her essay. And by the way, the editors wanted to make sure we would not miss the first line. And so look at that giant font. I've got to kind of peek at it here to read it. This is the story of a year you'll never want to revisit. Okay, I'll buy that. She goes on. There have been worse years in U.S. history and certainly worse years in world history, but most of us alive today have seen nothing like this one. You would need to be over 100. We have four members who are to remember the devastation of World War I in the 1918 flu pandemic. You would need to be roughly 90 to have a sense of the economic deprivation wrought by the Great Depression, and in your 80s to retain any memory of World War II and its horrors. The rest of us have had no training wheels for this. I like that. Exactly a year ago right now, we were together. There were no training wheels given to us. We had no idea what was coming down the pike. You know what we were, think we were talking about? 2020 vision for the new year. Yeah, right. <laughs> but this is what's rather troubling. The truth is, nobody's given us training wheels for 2021 either. We have no zero nada clue about what's coming. X and out 2020. Uh, she wraps it up here. The rest of us have no training wheels for this, for the recurrence of natural disasters that confirm just how much we have betrayed nature, for a virus that originated possibly with a bat only to upend the lives of virtually everyone on the planet and end the lives of roughly 1.5 million people around the world. Wow. We have, we have a phrase in English. Good riddance for bad rubbish. I mean, can you really, can you, look, can you really X out an entire year, just wipe it out? Actually, it turns out you can. And the secret is right here. I don't think the graphic artist knew what she or he was doing when the artist crafted this cover. Because if you look at this cover... And the Xing out, if you'll just let this happen to the magazine, that X becomes a what? It becomes a cross. And that's the truth. The only way to X out your past, the only way to X out 2020 is to cross it out, wipe it out, X it out. Only the cross, only the cross can do that which is precisely Peter's point. I want you to open your Bible, please, to that stunning moment. We're talking about Jerusalem, A.D. 31. Jerusalem. Acts chapter 2. Everybody knows the story of the day of Pentecost. Peter has, a, he has thousands of people. I don't know, because I've been in Jerusalem. I don't know how they got a, thousands of people in that space. They were up and down every alley. They were out in every flat space, probably around the temple. And Peter's preaching. Acts chapter 2. We're going to... Drop down to verse 12 and pick it up because somewhere in these moments ahead, there'll be the secret we're looking for. All right, let's go to Acts chapter 2. I'm in the NIV. Fellow Israelites, you can hear, you can hear the big fishermen thundering. Fellow Israelites, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs which God did among you through him as you yourselves know. 
This man was handed over to you by God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge, and you, with the help of wicked men, whoa, way to preach, way to speak truth to power, call a spade a spade. Wicked men, Peter, you're, you're awfully gutsy. And you, with the help of wicked men who are alive and perhaps listening, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. The, the, the thousands are cut to the quick. Notice their response. Drop down to verse 37. And when the people heard this, they were cut to the heart. And they said to Peter and the other apostles, hey, brothers, what shall we do? And Peter is ready. Here he goes. Peter replied, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And do you understand that in response to that altar call, over 3,000 people came forward and were baptized that very day. Unbelievable. A few days later, Peter has another crowd. It's just a few days later because all you have to do is just turn the page. Turn the page to, uh, to uh, chapter 3. And he pulls, he says, listen, that sermon, the Lord blessed that sermon. He anointed it. I'm going to preach it all over again. And he does. Watch this. Uh, this is uh, Acts chapter 3, verse 19. There he goes again with that word. Repent then and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out, that times of refreshing may come from the Lord, and that he may send the Messiah, the, the, the Christ, who has been appointed for you, even Jesus. Heaven must receive him for a, few, for a few years until the time comes for God to restore everything, as he promised long ago through his holy prophets. There is that word again, repent, repent, repent. You suppose that's the key? Anybody here know how to repent? I mean, we know it's a big deal. You know why we know it's a big deal? Because when John the Baptist comes preaching, the very first word out of his ever preached sermon is the word repent. And subsequently, the gospels say when Jesus comes preaching, the very first word he preaches is repent. And subsequently after that, when Peter preaches twice, the first word is repent, repent. So what's happening with this repent? I tell you what you and I know about repent. What we know about repent is what it isn't. We had a wonderful family time. Got to spend some time with our two granddaughters, Ella's seven and Izzy's almost three. And they fortunately brought along their parents, Kirk and Chelsea. And so we're sitting around. And as families do, we're reminiscing, talking about life and the kids growing up. And have you noticed this? To me, it's a great wonder of children. They can be in the same pod, in the same family, but siblings can be so different from each other. I mean, take our two kids. We, got, we, we have uh, Kirk and then we have Chrissy. When it comes, to, when, when it, when it comes to, to Chrissy, I mean, you could just look sideways at her and she'd repent in tears. But Kirk... I'm telling you what, with Kirk, there has to be some sort of incentive for him to repent. I mean, the clearer the consequences of his misdeed, the clearer it became, the more passionate and pronounced his sudden repentance on the spot. Hey, listen, there isn't a kid that doesn't know the meaning of that. You've done that. And you know what? Guess what? We do that as adults, don't we? Come on, let's not pick on the kids. How many times has our repentance been based more on remorse over the consequences rather than heartfelt sorrow over personal sin? Take the two. Take the two exhibits we're going to examine right now. Same night, same town, both of them there. I want you to watch these two. We're going to put two word pictures on the screen. Just see what you think. Let's start off with the first guy. His name is Judas. Now, so the moment I say Judas, you have a picture in your mind. In my mind, he's tall. He, he, he's, uh, he, he looks like the perfect executive. And I'm telling you, I'll tell you what, he is white collar, white collar to the max. He's always taking charge, Judas. Everybody knows the story of his treacherous betrayal. Everybody knows the story of Peter's heinous denial. Same town, same night. But look at the two differences in repentance. I'm going to go to the classic on the life of Jesus, Desire of Ages. 
Beautiful word pictures. We're not going to Google. You're going to get a picture in your mind as you read these words. And I want you to be watching Jesus. Watch Jesus in both of these word pictures because it's really the, 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 the take home picture is Jesus. Okay, so let's go to a Desire of Ages. Now, Judas has just walked into the council chamber, stunned everybody as he interrupts the proceedings. The prisoner is bound and gagged. Judas walks up to Caiaphas and hurling at his feet, 30 pieces of silver tinkle all over the temple's marble floor. That's what's just happened. I have sinned, cried Judas, in that I have betrayed the innocent blood, quoting Matthew 27. Judas now casts himself at the feet of Jesus, acknowledging him to be the Son of God and entreating him, begging him, pleading him to deliver himself. This was supposed to work. I purposely had you arrested so that, like Samson, when they came for you, you'd just go, and then you'd become king. Something has gone terribly wrong. You're not supposed to be here. He's begging. He's entreating Jesus to deliver himself. This, now watch Jesus. The Savior did not reproach his betrayer. I knew you. I knew you were. I knew who you were from the beginning. Not a word. He did not reproach his betrayer. Jesus knew that Jesus, Judas didn't repent. His confession was forced from his guilty soul by an awful sense of condemnation and a looking for of judgment. But Judas felt no deep heartbreaking grief that he had betrayed the spotless Son of God and, he, and that he had denied the Holy One of Israel. Yet Jesus spoke no word of condemnation. He looked pityingly upon Judas. And he says, as I read, just draws the veil aside to insert a line of conversation. And he said to Judas, for this hour came I into the world. So ridden with despair, Judas goes out and takes his own life. Peter probably should have gone out and taken his own life as well. But we're going to watch the same Jesus. With a man who, there's no white collar. Peter doesn't even wear collars. If he had any collar at all, it would have been a blue collar. This brash, bold Peter, he, he always is confident of being in control. Watch this moment. Keep looking for Jesus, but watch this. Same book, Desire of Ages. While the degrading oaths were fresh upon Peter's lips, I never knew that blankety blank blank man in all my life turning the air blue with fisherman obscenities. While the degrading oaths were fresh upon Peter's lips and the shrill crowing of the cock was still ringing in his ears, the Savior turned from the frowning judges and looked full upon his poor disciple, at the same time, Peter's eyes were drawn to his master. You ever have somebody looking at you and you kind of realize, it feels like somebody's looking at you? And so, yeah, Peter turns his eyes and are drawn to his master. In that gentle countenance, he read deep pity and sorrow, but there was no anger there. The sight of that pale, suffering face, those quivering lips, that look of compassion and forgiveness, pierced his heart like an arrow. Conscience was aroused. Memory was active. The Savior's tender mercy, his kindness and long suffering, his gentleness and patience toward his erring disciples, all was remembered. Peter reflected with horror upon his own ingratitude, his falsehood, his perjury. Once more he looked at the master and saw a sacrilegious hand raised to smite him in the face. Unable longer to endure the scene, he rushed heartbroken from the hall. And on the very spot where Jesus had poured out his soul in agony to his father in Gethsemane, Peter fell upon his face and wished that he might die. Exhibit A, Exhibit B, two classic examples of repentance. One forced with this sense of remorse and fear of consequences. The other, a genuine sorrow that breaks his heart. Repent. What does it mean? This word, this, this human word, this personal word, this, this intellectual experience, this, this existential word we call repentance. What does that mean for you and me? When you and I repent, isn't this true? We're... we're 
responding to some sort of cognitive awareness that something is out of sorts inside of me right now. I know something's wrong. It may be a memory that triggers it. It may be a word or a rash of words that triggers it. Some action I take triggers it. And always I have this sense that I should not have done what I did. I should not have spoken what I spoke. I should not have, I should not have reacted the way I know I did. Now remember, we're, 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 we're going to this word, repent, because Peter has spoken it. I'm going to put that uh, line again on the screen for us. Repent then, we got it, and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out. There it is. How to X out, how to wipe out, how to cross out 2020. Repent. Repentance isn't about, look at folks, it's not about wiping out future sins. How can you wipe out sins that haven't even been committed? But repentance can be for sins 30 seconds ago, three minutes ago, 30 days ago, 30 years ago. That conscience under the direction of the Holy Spirit suddenly begins to flash red and you recall what you had hoped you would never remember. Repent. And Peter calls us to repent and then turn to God. That one line is a reminder that, that every sin, no matter how venial, how mortal, is a turning away from God, which means sin is a hugely relational word, isn't it? To the one who has loved me more than anyone in the universe, I have sinned. I have turned away. Now, I need to say when, I talk, when I'm talking about that uh, flashing red light, sometimes that red light flashes by mistake. It's not the Holy Spirit flashing the red light. Sometimes we flash the red light ourselves in order to punish ourselves, in order to somehow pay back or pay off the conviction that we've had, we've, we've spent our lives wrestling over. I don't know why that line is coming to me right now, but some of you perhaps have an overactive red light. The conscience just is so trigger sensitive that it's always going off. I need to tell you that the conscience is the instrument of the Holy Spirit that speaks to our souls, but the conscience must be surrendered to Jesus himself. You've got to say, Jesus, just take my conscience. I don't know if this is, a, I don't know if this is really a, re, a blinking light or if this is something I'm doing to myself. I need you to take this moment. Otherwise, and I was talking to a young man not too long ago who have been burdened and played by this flashing red light. You don't have to be, you don't have to be a victim of that red light. You can find the peace. You just ask Jesus, is this you flashing the light or is this me? You'll know quick. You'll know quickly. The fact of the matter is, every sin we commit is a personal sin that turns us away from the one who loves us most. So that when, when Nathan comes into the throne room, another, another throne room, with a startling announcement, O oh, king, the gig is up. God is aware of what you and Bathsheba have been doing. When David bursts into tears, as Peter burst into tears, when, when, da when David begins to sob his contrition and repentance, he expresses what Peter felt in the Garden of Gethsemane that night. Watch David, who, com who composes this, this, this moving prayer of repentance. Read it again. If you haven't read Psalm 51 in a while, just take it home this afternoon and read it. Let your soul bask in its good news. But in that prayer, David has this word against you. Talking about sin being a relational proposition against you and you only, O oh God, have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. All sin is an affront, is an attack on the one who loves us most. 
Against you and you alone. And by the way, he didn't say against Bathsheba and Bathsheba alone, I have sinned. Against, against Uriah and Uriah alone, I have sinned. No, no, no. Not even against me and me alone. Against you and you alone. That's why I carried in my wallet a, a, a picture of Karen. It is a very lovely picture of Karen. I, I will be happy to uh, inform you. I don't carry that picture in my wallet so that I don't forget what she looks like. I say, what was that again? No. Do you know why I carry that picture in my wallet? So that I will always be reminded of the girl whose 24-7 love I live for and reciprocate most of all. I carry that picture in my wallet because we're like this. We're like this. And that picture is a reminder. A reminder. David knew that he and God had been like this. And now he did that. And his heart is broken. Against you and you alone have I sinned. Sin is a violation of my covenant relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Guess what? Every sin. And there's some of us are thinking, well, you know what? Whew, I'm looking back over 2020. There was, there was not really a big sin in my life. The little book Steps to Christ said, wake up, buddy. Yo, girl, wake up. Worse than a drunkard, worse than alcoholism is the sin of human pride. And if you're looking back over 2020 and you can't see anything, then that's the sin you've got. And it's the worst of all. Repent. John the Baptist begins. Jesus begins. Repent. Peter, Peter comes along in their path. Repent, repent. What is it? What is up with this thing? Repent. You want to X out? You want to wipe out? You want to cross out 2020? And the record of your sins? Repent. Just repent. I scribble this down here in the margin. Repentance describes a radical turning from sin to a new way of life oriented towards God. Against you and you only have I sinned. There comes a moment when you realize that this line could be true about you too. Uh, Hebrews chapter 6, verse 6 describes people who to their loss, they are crucifying the Son of God all over again and subjecting him to public disgrace. I realize that that sin has done that, re-crucified my Lord Jesus which is why it's so critical that the record get expunged. In fact, this is, uh, this is Peter. Repent and turn back to him so that your sins may be wiped out. And uh, David Bentley Hart comes along in his uh, acclaimed uh, translation of the New Testament, and he renders it this way. So change your hearts and turn about so that your sins may be expunged, obliterated, wiped away, wiped out, just so they may be expunged. Which is why David prays exactly how he prays in that, that beautiful Psalm 51 prayer. Hide your face, O God. Hide your face from my sins. Blot out all my iniquity. There it is. Just blot it out. Create in me a pure heart, O God. And renew a steadfast spirit, steadfast spirit within me. Blot out all my 2020 sins. 2021 has begun, dear God. I take one more look back. Blot them all out right now. And right here. David, again, cleanse me and I'll be clean. Speaking of the fresh snow we got overnight, wash me and I will be whiter than snow. It's the gospel. It's the goodness of the gospel. Steps to Christ. That's a beautiful chapter. On repentance. Read it sometime. Just the, the whole chapter is a masterpiece. It's, it's closing words will be our closing words right now. I want you to read this. Just Again, look for the picture of Jesus tucked, tucked away in these sentences. For if we confess our sins, this is 1 John 1 and 9, by the way. In fact, you know what? I, we're going to get to steps of Christ, but I, I don't want to miss this. Let's read this out loud together. It's a beautiful, beautiful uh, New Testament promise. For if we confess our sins... He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I mean, that's a promise. 
We confess, that's what repentance is. Turn around, turn back. I confess that to you. He, he not only forgives us, but the cleansing is embedded. Here's steps to Christ now. We have been great sinners, but Christ died that we might be forgiven. I put the brackets in here. What we've gathered to celebrate today at the Lord's Supper. Jesus' death and his promise of forgiveness. The merits of his sacrifice are sufficient to present to the Father in our behalf. Those to whom he has forgiven most will love him most. I want to leave that line right there. Some of you are embarrassed that you've had to keep going to Jesus again and again for the same sin over and over. It's almost as if he knows why I'm coming. This little line here has put a whole new twist to that human reality that I struggle with. Why do I never seem to get the point? Why do I keep repeating what I know is cutting to his heart? Now watch this. Those to whom he has forgiven most. Forgiven most because you've been going to him the most. You've been going back again and again and again and again. Those to whom he has forgiven most will love him most. Now keep reading. And will stand nearest to him, nearest to his throne to praise him for his great love and infinite sacrifice. I'm just let that percolate in your mind for a moment. You know, you know, Dwight, man, I've seen you so many times here. Always asking to be forgiven. Repeat, repeat, repeat. Don't ever regret that you keep going back. There is never a sin God does not forgive. Ever, ever, ever. And the more times you go back, the closer it draws you to the one you keep turning to. Is that, is that bad news? No, you just keep, you keep going back to Jesus. You keep repenting. You keep confessing. You keep receiving his forgiveness. Those who, who have gone to him again and again will stand nearest to his throne to praise him for his great love and infinite sacrifice. Look, I may be at the very end of that crowd, but there's some of you here right now that are going to be standing right beside the throne. You'll be there. <laughs> He said, listen, you might as well come up here. You have been here so many times, girl. Boy, you have been here so many times. Stand right here by me. Isn't that beautiful? That's all steps to Christ for you. The last paragraph in the chapter on repentance. It is when we most fully comprehend the love of God that we best realize the sinfulness of sin. You want sin to, to, to keep, to remain sinfulness in you, to remain sinful in your mind? Then just keep brooding, keep contemplating. The love of God poured out, as Ryan just sang, on Calvary. Brood on the love of God. I add these words in brackets, and you will heighten your sense of sin sinfulness. Yep, 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 yep. Last line. And when we see the length of the chain that was let down for us in this pandemic pit where we live on this earth, when we understand something of the infinite sacrifice that Christ has made in our behalf, the heart is melted with tenderness and contrition. Oh, my friends, I'm telling you what. I'm telling you, here it is. There is a way. There is a way to X out 2020. And that is to let the cross be what crosses out, what wipes out, what blots out, what expunges the record behind us. That's why the cross is here. Isn't that beautiful? You know what? If this is true, and I believe with all my heart it is, then at the foot of the cross, we could not be in a more perfect place this second day in 2021 than right here at the foot of Jesus, at the table of the Lord's Supper. Oh, Jesus. What can we say? Thank you, thank you, thank you. You went to that tree. You went to that cross so that billions one day would find in you the Xing out that we desperately long for 
deep within our hearts, our minds, our lives. We're at the right place. This is the perfect place. And so in these few moments we have left, so we take the emblems that you've given us so that we might never forget. Oh, Jesus, do that divine work. Wash over our souls, our minds, our families. Wash over our marriages. Wash over our lives. Right now, please, right here in your name. Amen. Think of the last time someone said, I'm praying for you. Didn't it give you a sense of peace and reassurance that somebody cares for me? I know how I feel when I get an email from one of our viewers saying, Yo, Dwight, I've been praying for you lately. There's nothing like knowing someone is praying for you. So I want to offer you an opportunity to partner. Let me, let us partner with you in prayer. If you have a special prayer request or a praise of thanksgiving you'd like to share with us, I'm inviting you to contact one of our friendly chaplains simple to do. You can call our toll-free number, 877, the two words, His Will, 877, His Will. That friendly voice that answers, you tell him, you tell her what your prayer need is. We'll join with you in that petition. And may the God who answers prayer journey with you these next few days until we're right back here together again next time.